Well, you're the principal at Calexico Mission School and Calexico Mission School is located in Calexico, literally across the border. So 85% of the students here are living in Mexico, correct? That's right. So about, um, yeah, I think we're about 85% of our students currently come across the border every day to attend school. Okay. Are, are most of them Mexican nationals or are they we um, have a, citizenship? We have a pretty good mix. Mm -hmm. I, I would say about half and half. Half of those students uh, that reside in Mexico are U.S. citizens, so they are born to Mexican nationals, but they, you know, opted to have their children here, and therefore they have a dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, you know, parents understand that, well, that's only half the battle, right? Because the other half is you need to make sure that you know English because just you having the, the citizenship sometimes will get you so far, but you need to be able to have the language. And so that's why a lot of them end up coming to, to study here with us. And then those that are um, not U.S. citizens, they have to go through the vetting process and um, get their student visa. And, um, and that allows them to study here as foreigners. Um, and they get a designation that is called border commuters. And this is for students that reside either in Mexico or in Canada um, because they are crossing the border on a daily basis. And so with this visa, they have the opportunity to study in a, in a private school. And again, just like the other families um, that have US citizens, the, these kids that, that are Mexican citizens are choosing to come here because they also want to learn English because even though uh, they might go back to Mexico later on uh, because it's a border town if you are able to master both languages that means better opportunities down the road for them mm -hmm. that's great um, one of the things that we like to focus on is helping families that are facing deportation or okay. families that are choosing to relocate to Mexico because sure. there is an increase so we like to help give them um, information to help them sure. better in that transition. So one of the things is um, there's, I call it a hot topic because a lot of children that are U.S. citizens do attend school in the U.S., mm -hmm. public schools, but they they're, um, they do live in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> um, not everyone is able to afford um, private education and in some situations you can have both parents or your primary parent that's um, been deported so they're not able to um, to do that. But speaking directly to families that are able to make that sacrifice because a lot of people do continue to work in the U.S. and do the same thing, like you said, commute daily back and forth. What what advice or what um why what direction would you steer families towards in this community going towards public school or going towards private school because there are other private schools also but which direction would you steer them those families and why well um, so we need to understand that as a U.S. citizen. Um, children have a right to uh, access to free education. Um, however, that it's easier said than done, and that's because there's logistics, right? I mean, um, at the end of the day, uh, what makes that possible for families to, to send a child to a public school free of charge for them is because the local school um, in the community is being subsidized by the government who is getting those funds directly from your um, property uh, taxes. And this is why when, when you reside in a specific location, you are assigned to the local uh, community school because uh, when you pay your, your property taxes, those go back to that particular school, right? And so even though it's quote unquote free, <clears throat> It's really because of all the individuals that live in that community that are sustaining financially that, that institution. <clears throat> and, and therefore then allowing students in the neighborhood to, to go to that school. But then what happens when you then are not living in that community and yet still want to send your child there, right? Because again, technically it, it, it's a right, you know, as a citizen, but but the whole system can collapse if, if we're just taking, taking, taking and not contributing, right? Because then the burden is placed on those individuals that are living in that community 
and and are paying their property tax and are you know sustaining the the the, the school the local school um, but those individuals that are not living there and still sending their kids then um, you you know that creates a problem of not only overpopulation you know oversized classrooms which unfortunately goes hand in hand with lower quality of education you know that is imparted um, that can lend also to more behavioral problems because a larger class it's harder to to manage for a teacher so anyways you know you can see that ripple effect of, of something like that right um, and and you said it well you know at the beginning it is a hot topic because on the one hand you have kids that are are wanting an education, parents that are trying to figure out a way to provide that for them um, and trying to kind of find those those loopholes. And, and, and it really is a loophole because what ends up happening here is that a lot of these people that um, live outside of the local community, in fact, outside of the country for that matter, um, they have to uh, find uh, fake addresses where and, and not I don't mean fake in the sense that they're not real addresses they're real addresses but they they're not really living in the addresses that they're uh, presenting to the to the school district um, so the alternative then is um, a school like ours you know a private school where um, where you can actually it doesn't really matter where you live in fact it doesn't even matter if you are you a citizen or not um, obviously, you would have to have a student visa for you to attend here, but a, a school like ours provides an opportunity to um, still give that, that education to your child without having to find the loopholes or do things that are on the margin, legally speaking, you know, because again, you know, I mean, people always find a way, but it's not... Is that right? Well, again, it depends who you ask and how you look at, at this issue. Um, but if you are coming to a private school like ours, um, then you're not really doing anything illegal and you're still accomplishing your goal, your objective, which is to provide a, U, a quality U.S. education to a child that um, you know, would like to, to study in the States. Very well said. Thank you. I think that'll help a lot of people. Um, also, okay, so what um, what would you say are the biggest challenges that um, you see as a principal or just as a, you know, on the administrative level in this type of environment? Well, I think that you also mentioned a word earlier, and that is sacrifice. Um, there's sacrifice elements that that is part of this that that it's necessary for this to work um, if, if you're choosing to send a student um, to a private school like ours on the part of the parents it's a financial sacrifice because the reason why we can take those students um, even though they might be living in, in Mexico across the border is because we run our school not from subsidies that we receive from the government but it's basically based on the tuition that we receive from the families that enroll their, their children here. And so when you're earning pesos and having to exchange that into dollars on a volatile market um, at a rate that is not uh, favorable, um, it's challenging. It's challenging uh, for the families and therefore for us because again, we need to be able to be, you know, receiving those those tuition monies to be able to continue our operations of the school. But for the families themselves, um, it's it's a huge sacrifice um, because one, if if you are earning pesos and you're spending dollars, I, again, you're already at a disadvantage because of the exchange rate. But the fact that that exchange rate can can change, it's as if you come to me and I tell you, okay, well, tuition for this month is this much, but next month is going to be this much because, in fact, actually, I'm not even going to tell you how much it's going to be because I don't know what the exchange will be. Um, and so you're kind of having to adjust as you go. And, and so that's very difficult. Um, you know, thankfully, things have been quite stable, you know, over the last few years, but there have been moments where there's been a huge increase 
uh, in, in, in the exchange rate, you know, getting your pesos into converting them into dollars. So definitely that is a challenge, uh, like I said, for initially for the families, but then that trickles into the to the school because again, we are operating on, on those tuition monies. Um, and the second challenge is the fact that because we are, even though technically in the US, but servicing a community across the border, um, well, these students are having to cross that international border on a daily basis. And um, and that that is a process, you know, in, in, in the sense that um, if, if you are trying to be here on time when school starts by eight o'clock in the morning, uh, for a lot of our students, that means making the sacrifice of waking up early, sometimes maybe as early as five in the morning to kind of start their morning routine, to be able to get to the border by 6.30 and wait in line, you know, anywhere from 30 to an hour, sometimes even longer, um, as you're being pushed and shoved because uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of order that that is kept, you know, at, at the at the port of entry, and so um, so even with a student lane, for instance, um, that is supposed to be exclusive for students that live in Mexico that are studying over here. Um, unfortunately, there's so many students um, that and nobody really keeping order that you know people cut in front of the line and they push and they shove and uh, and for instance for us who um, who have kids from kinder all the way to high school, we have little ones that sometimes kind of get in the middle of that shuffle and, and, and they're being pushed and, you know, and and so it can be not just chaotic, but kind of scary and dangerous. Um, so that's a challenge also that, that our families face. Um, and, and so they go through that, you know, on, on a daily basis. Uh, but I think it's remarkable because by the time they, they, they do that little 10 minute walk from the port of entry to the school, um, they, they get here with a big smile on their face, even though they might have gone through some horrific experience going across the border. I mean, they're here ready to learn, you know, and so I think that's amazing. Uh, every time I see my students come in, uh, arrive on campus, you know, ready to learn um, after going through, you know, whatever they went through at the border. Um, to me, it's just inspiring because these kids, I mean, nothing faces them. You know, obviously, they wish things would be a little different, but, um, you know, it is what it is. From my perspective, I think the kids appreciate um, the opportunity, the education a lot more. I know that's one of the things we've seen in our children. So I want to ask, because it is a sacrifice, like you said, because um, that dollars to pesos that that's very real one of the things that too i know a lot of people when they do consider private education and have to pay for it um because it is an investment it's mm -hmm. an investment into your child into their future so what type of um at because this school goes from k to 12 mm -hmm. what type of um <clears throat> careers are you seeing that um i know most of your children do continue on to college education mm -hmm. which is one of the things that a lot of people do like private education because um it's almost kind of an expectation mm -hmm. to continue um the education but here in the, um, the time, because you've had how many years as principal? Six years. Okay. But, and, you, and you've had ties with the school before, too. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, too, that we like that people in the community that this school has a reputation. So um, that's one of the things that really enticed us. But what are you seeing? Um, what type of careers are you seeing the children graduate into in, as adults? Well, um... Yeah, I, I think for us, the the philosophy that we that we have, um, it's it's a very holistic approach, right? So we want to make sure that our students are growing not just academically but beyond the academics as individuals. So we want them to grow to be good people. And for us, what that means is you gotta honor God, and that's where it all starts. And you gotta be respectful and kind to others. And um, and that's really the, 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 the gist of it. You know, that's kind of what it boils down to. And so for us, um, with that, you know, yes, we try to emphasize the, okay, you gotta go beyond high school. You have to go and study um, college. Um, but more than that is, 
we want to make sure that you are fulfilling your 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 purpose. We want you to recognize that you're not just some accident that happens to be here. And uh, we believe that if you came to Calexico Mission School, it's because God brought you here for a reason. And, and 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 part of your experience here is kind of discovering that, right? And so as you're growing up and you're learning, you know, not just to add and subtract and read and write, but but learning. Um, you know those those life lessons that will allow you to be successful in life and by success i don't mean like money and and, and prestige but 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 again being a person of quality in, in the way that you relate to others um then that begins to also uh plant a seed of this idea that okay well what am i going to do with my life you know how am i going to serve how am i going to um, honor God you know what is it that I can do to to help my neighbor and and so then as you start thinking that way then you begin to realize that okay well there's all kinds of different uh, career opportunities that I can go into and so that's kind of how we approach it um, one of the the, the the advantages that um, I, I, I think private schools have over some of the some of the uh, public schools is the the quality of, of instruction and the attention that our students receive because just the the mere size of a class compared to here compared to a public school um, allows our teachers to really you know get very personal with our students um, and and there is a a genuine bond you know that is created so that if a student for instance is struggling academically the teacher can kind of push and provide the support um, and and also on 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 the other end, the student feels comfortable, you know, be going to the teacher if they need help or 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 getting that little nudge, you know, that they might need, um, because they know that it's for their own good, and we're kind of seeking to uh, push them in a direction that is gonna be beneficial to them down the down the line, and and so in terms of the academics, uh, you know, that's not the exception. We wanna. Put that thought in their in their heads that hey you know you can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish and because so many of our students do come from from mexico and, and many of them are mexican citizens not everybody ends up studying in the states many of them end up going back to mexico in fact even some of the u.s citizens just because unfortunately i you know college has gotten so expensive um and and somewhat inaccessible you know sometimes um that you can tap into the, 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 the opportunities that Mexico gives you. Um, and we've noticed that even though you are getting a U.S. education, a quality U.S. education, um, because you are learning more than just a curriculum, you are really becoming a critical thinker. You are learning good study habits. Uh, even if you decide to go and study in Mexico, you're going to be successful. And so we have a great track record of students that have graduated from mission school that have gone on to very prestigious universities, both in Mexico and in the U.S., from the UC system schools to very prestigious private schools, both here in the state and outside of the state. And, um, and you know, you name it, you know, a, a lot of a lot of different careers. Uh, one of the great, um, I guess, advantages that we have is that uh, we are we're not an autonomous institution. We are part of the second largest private school system in the US um, And that belongs to the Seventh-day Adventist Church And so not too far from here just you know about two and a half three hours north of us We have Loma Linda University, which is one of the premier medical schools in the nation and so um, we have the opportunity to get some of our students to do summer programs there, you know, and so um, so, so that is also one of the advantages that, that you have sometimes when you are able to go to some of these private schools that sometimes have um, networks and, and opportunities for some of your students to um, explore careers that maybe they're not even serious about or maybe they're just kind of curious and then they go through that experience and then they're able to like say, oh, okay, you know, maybe, maybe this is something that I want to explore. explore. Um, for instance, just two weeks ago, we took our, our seniors who are taking the anatomy and physiology class, which is an upper uh, division science course, um, to Loma Linda University to visit their cadaver lab. And so, you know, they were in there, you know, studying and learning from, from real um, 
body is the way that your medical students learn. And this is, you know, kids in high school still. So, so these are the type of opportunities that, um, that you can give your, your children if you are able to um, make it work. And, and like you said, I think that it is important for parents to recognize that it's not just money that you're spending, it's money that you're investing. Um, and, and I know it's hard, but, you know, I think sometimes we think that it's not possible or we don't have the money. But if, if, if you start paying attention to, you know, how much money you give Starbucks a month or, you know, you pay for that phone bill with all the little extras or all your subscriptions, you know, to all these streaming services, um, pretty soon you realize that, well, I'm investing a lot of money in things that are not giving me a good return for that. And if you were maybe a little bit more strategic and intentional about how you spend your money, you would realize that it's it's actually within re- reach if, if you were to be a little bit more strategic and intentional about how you spend your money. Um, you know, I, and not only that, but as a Ministry of Education, we are also um, always willing to uh, provide financial aid and, and, and figure out ways to support families that... Um, want their children to study here but might not necessarily have the means. Um, we do have a large network of um, people that are constantly uh, funding our scholarship um, funds to, to be able to provide some of these um, scholarships to, to students that, that need them and that would want to continue studying here. And Without them, they wouldn't be able to. I'm glad you bring that up because um, there are a lot of people that are in the situations that they are able to give. And Mm -hmm. um, as I said, it's a very hot topic. So there are a lot of people that um, that do want to help. Mm -hmm. So are people able to donate? How would someone donate um, to help uh, these children that are are, uh, parents have been deported get a private quality education? Well, um, you guys can go on the website at calexicomissionschool.com and there's a little tab there where it says donate and you can go through that process and that will walk you through. You can call us and we can take a donation over the phone. And, and as a donor, you can stipulate you know, how you want us to use your, your, your monies that you're donating. If you want to specifically say, you know what, I, I want it for like a needy family, uh, but I want this student to be able to maintain you know, at least a C average, you know, GPA, um, or, you know, this is for somebody who is like a single um, uh, parent family uh, student um, who's struggling, you know, I mean, whatever it is that that you as a donor uh, would like to stipulate in in, in how we use those monies, we honor that. And and, um, in fact, if you wanted to sponsor a specific student, um, and, and on a monthly basis, contribute to that student's account. That's something also that we can set up. Uh, so there's is it tax ways. deductible? It is. So we are a nonprofit um, organization, and so all your donations are tax deductible, um, as long as you don't specify a specific individual that would be benefiting from your monies. In other words, um, as long as it's given as in in general terms. In other words, because I can have, for instance, you know, my brother pay my son's tuition and just say, hey, you know, uh, I'm going to give you money. You pay my son's tuition, uh, but put it through as a a donation. Um, Unfortunately, you know, that that wouldn't work. But if it's just kind of going into the general pot, if you will, you know, into that that scholarship fund. um, Yes, all your donations would be 100 percent tax deductible. Absolutely. And if I may say, um, you know, we, you know, I include myself because, um, in fact, all of our faculty and staff are so committed to our ministry that every single one of them, besides giving of themselves as teachers, obviously they, you know, it's our job and they do get paid, but everybody here actually contributes uh, towards that scholarship fund out of their own pocket. They determine, you know, the amounts, uh, but I can tell you that every single one of our staff uh, contributes because they believe in what we do. You know, it's not just 
uh, a job, but we really see it as a ministry because we want to be a part of this uh, growing process for the students. Um, and we understand that that sometimes it's necessary to provide some additional uh, funds for uh, you know families to be able to make it work. The things that the way that we found out about this school, we actually saw a documentary, mm -hmm. well, news clip from BBC mm -hmm. or BCC. I'm sorry, BBC. the Brit, mm -hmm. right? Uh, about two girls that were going to school here and one of the things that they talked about was um, people jumping the border jumping into the uh, gates so our children have been here for a year this is their first full year and i can uh, tell you that everything that um that you're saying that we really see that we really we see the difference in our children um our children were uh these were all public educated in public school systems and um, we don't have to fight with our children to do homework. It's the end of the school year, but this is the first time that my third grader actually did homework without have, having an argument. But we've, we've really seen a difference. And as he mentioned, the holistic approach, we've seen an overall difference. So you can't put a price on that when he talks his investment. Oh, so one of the things that, um, that we saw in that that was kind of like we we worried about but we haven't worried about the safety i mean you guys do know that um that's another thing that comes up a lot the violence in mexico versus the violence in the uh, u.s so um there's never um been anything that we've worried about say safety of our children at the school but as the principal i'm sure that you especially having children um in mexico um come here how do you approach that or what, what's your experience with that? How, how do you speak to that? Sure, yeah. Well, um, no, no school, life is a risk. Let me just start there, right? So the moment, the moment we leave our homes, um, we know that we're stepping into a world where anything can happen, right? So we can't leave in fear. And in fact, that is one of the things that even in, in this day and age, right, where, where there's so much um, Zoom, is it, it 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 just incites fear because i mean news outlets their business is to alarm and to you know push that panic button and and so we're preconditioned as a society to to live in fear but even 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 that right i think that that is one of the main differences that you will experience here because there's so many promises in scripture that talk about God watching over us and protecting us. And and when you're starting your day uh, claiming those promises and, and, and kind of with that mindset, um, yeah, it is a crazy world. Yes, there's a lot of stuff that happens. Um, but, um, you know, it's interesting because I was talking uh, to a parent um, after some of the recent incidents with, with some of the, um, the violence that, that's been happening around the nation, unfortunately, even in schools. And, and she was saying, well, you know, I, I, I'm afraid because I know the devil is real, you know. And, and I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. But so is God. And, and I think that it's important that if, if we are going to start our days uh, knowing that there's a risk in every step that we take, we need to know that, that God is watching over us. I think that's first and foremost. And so we try to instill that with our students. So when we start our school day, for instance, every class from kinder all the way to high school, um, we have a short little reflection that our teachers have with our students where we pray and we specifically ask for petitions from students. So we just don't recite some memorized prayer. We actually want to instill in our students this idea that you can pour your heart out to God, and and uh, and we want them to know that, you know, whatever burdens you might be carrying, um, you can bring them before God, and 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 He hears, right? So um, it's interesting because you can go into any of those classrooms in the morning, you know, when the school day is starting, and and just uh, eavesdrop and, and and hear what the requests are, and there'll be anything from like parents having marital problems to um, you know issues at the border to uh, financial concerns uh, because even our kids are picking up on what you know what's going on at home right even though as, as parents sometimes we try to keep things private kids know what's going on and they are worried and they are concerned and and so they they kind of lay it all you know and because they know it's a safe place and, and they can do that so 
so I think that's the first thing, you know, knowing and instilling in our kids that idea that, look, you can come to God with your fears and your anxiety and whatever it is is stressing you out. Uh, if it's the, the, you know, the violence that is happening around the world, well, you can come to God with that. Now, obviously, um, just because you believe in God doesn't mean that you're going to just not do anything and, and, and take zero action whatsoever to keep um, our campus safe. Um, no, I mean, we are very intentional. We, we try to have a very safe um, environment, not only in terms of um, trying to keep away, you know, um, potential dangers, but but even the way that our students relate to each other. Like, we we don't have fights. And I'm not, I don't want to paint this like, like we're the perfect place, the perfect school, because, you know, there's no such a thing. But... Um, but we try to address issues of bullying. We try to uh, be proactive and, and, and educate our students about uh, if you see something, say something. If you are going to get caught up in some little scuffle, like, okay, what could you have done better? You know, and so we're trying to constantly educate them so that they understand that they have a responsibility as a member of our school community to contribute to keeping that safe environment. So it's not just coming from the top down, you know, from my office as, as principal, but they create that environment by the way they relate to each other and, and the way that they look out for each other. And so we want them to know that they do have the responsibility towards each other. Now, beyond that, in terms of, you know, uh, more along the lines of what you're talking about and keeping our students safe in the midst of all these crazy things that are happening, um, you know, the the border can be a curse, but it's also a blessing in the sense that it's a natural filter that any of those students that if anybody wanted to bring in something illegal, you know, it's going to be harder because they know that they have to go through that border. And if they get caught, uh, well, there's serious consequences. Um, <clears throat> now, the other thing is, so we don't have, we have a closed campus, okay? So um, we are able to buzz in the, the people that are gonna be coming in on campus. So we monitor that uh, with cameras and we give them access uh, to the campus. Um, but, but uh, and so we don't have uh, like police presence, you know, because there's no need for that. Um, but if anything, because we are located literally across the street from the fence that divides the two countries, uh, we have CBP basically stationed right outside the school, uh, you know, patrolling, and um, we have a good relationship with the local PD, and um, and whenever we've needed them, which haven't hasn't really been, uh, I, I would say maybe in the six years that I've been here, twice where we actually had a break in, um, and and. And this happened actually outside of school um, hours, but uh, but we don't really have issues like that. You know, we do have the occasional um, person that you know hops over the fence and you know tries to make it across. Um, but to be honest, you know that has been happening since I can remember. I had the fortune of um, being a student here back in the early '90s, and uh, back when the fence was just a chain link fence. Uh, which was much easier to hop over. Uh, so we, we, we would see a lot more activity, but, but now um, you see it, but it's very, very rare, uh, especially during, during school hours. There might be um, a little bit more activity in the evenings, at night, um, but you know, we never have felt that our students are ever in, in any harm. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just jump back a little bit where we were talking about, um, you mentioned the holistic approach sure. to education that you guys take. Um, also, one of the things that um, I know that you guys provide is um, once a month for the parents, you have uh, seminars. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more to the advantages sure. for the parents? So um, not just the investment in their child, but different things that you offer that other schools don't offer. Well, sure. So we... We recognize that we are partners in the development of these uh, students because education starts at home. You know, no school, no teacher will be able to replace the role of a father or a mother in, in terms of the development and, and, and the growth that, that happens in the life of a student. Um, however, having said that, 
um, there's plenty of studies that show that by the time a student is in in second grade, uh, parents kind of slide down from being the number one priority to number three because so much time is spent at school. I mean, many of the kids actually say, oh, it's like our second home. And it really truly is because if you just go by by the number of, of hours that they are spending here, um, it's easy to recognize that the school will have a tremendous amount of influence in, in students, right? Um, however, again, we cannot take or replace the parents. So, so we need to work together and, and that's how we see it, right? But unfortunately, we have discovered that um, sometimes our parents uh, need to be guided and educated uh, so that they can do a better job at, at being mom or being dad. And, and, and so what we have discovered is that if we can bring qualified individuals to share with them on different topics that are of interest and benefit uh, to these families, regardless of the age of their children, because usually what we try to do is we try to um, do these um, monthly seminars where we invite our, our school community to attend <clears throat> and uh, we try to share information with them that is going to benefit their, their, their whole family dynamics. And so the topics can range from safety, whether it is coming across the border or while you're navigating the virtual world. Um, and, and again, we try to bring experts, right, in all these fields. And so, um, so they learning about, you know, how do I keep my, my, my child safe, you know, because now they have this wonderful device called a cell phone, but that also it's a portal into a world that a lot of times we as parents don't even know how deep they can get into uh, situations that can be dangerous for these children. Um, and, and so we, we try to educate them about that or, or just in terms of health. Um, particularly, for instance, during the pandemic, we, we realize that um, there's a lot of emphasis that is placed sometimes on the physical health um, but not enough on the social emotional health. And so we were very intentional about bringing individuals that would address those those areas. Um, we also were hit hard in this community uh, during during the intensity of, of those um, COVID months um, where a lot of our, our school community uh, suffered loss. And so we were able to bring individuals that could um, walk them through the grieving process and, and helping them, you know, navigate through that difficult time in their lives. Um, we have had um, people talk about, you know, nutrition and, and how that impacts uh, learning. Uh, we have had individuals that have spoken about um, uh, marital relationships and how that impacts um, our children or how to better communicate with, with uh, teenagers, especially. Um, so, you know, there's a whole different um, array of, of topics that have been addressed. And we're constantly looking at, at new individuals and topics to present to our parents. Um, because for us, it's important that parents have the tools to be able to, uh, again, do their part in, in, in the in the in the uh, training of the children, you know. So um, that's a little bit of what we try to do to, to help them with, with their responsibilities as parents. So thank you for sure. We're probably gonna see this video. Sure. And um, really like what you're saying, but then look and see that next year when they look at the um, website that you're not gonna be there. So I'd like you just to speak to that. It's a big transition for a lot of families. And like I said, that's who a lot of our, um, the people that we not target but that we make these videos for are sure. for and um, so just to provide them that comfort of um, the transition that um, the school I mean the, the school has been here I think 85 years mm -hmm. so I mean the school has continued on he's not 85 and as you heard him say that he went here too but I just want to um, during anyone that's going through this to reassure you and let him speak for himself. That sure, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I can say that I, I'm just one of the many faces that, that has had the privilege of being a part of this amazing ministry that, like you said, has been around for 85 years. And so in, in that time, there's been 
many, many individuals, uh, both in the administrative side as well as in the classroom, who um, have done their part to make sure that whoever is here studying admission school um, is receiving quality education. And this is because, um, like I said earlier, we are not an autonomous institution. We are part of a system. And as a system, um, we have a philosophy that, that guides the way that we operate. And so uh, while I had the privilege and, and it really truly was an honor to serve this community uh, for six years, um, the person that is stepping into this role um, is somebody that continues with that vision, that understands what the school is all about uh, and will do everything in her power to ensure that that, that legacy continues. Uh, because it is, it is much bigger than just the individual that happens to, you know, have their, their name outside the, the principal's office, right, on that plaque. It's, it's really understanding that um, this school was established for a specific purpose, and that, I, that was to provide quality education, holistic education, to the local community here. And, and by the way, this is true for any Adventist institution, whether it's a preschool, an elementary, a high school, a college, um, we all follow the same model. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, can, I can say that the, good, the school will, will continue to operate the way that it has always done it um, with, with you know, ensuring that they are tending to, to the needs of every single one of our students. Um, our motto is educating the hand, the mind, and the heart. And, and so that is what drives our instruction. That is what drives what we do. And, and so, um, you know, our entire team that is behind CMS um, is guided by that, by that notion that we are committed to uh, serving the, the students that come uh, and, and guarding their hearts and instructing them so that, you know, they can be great individuals. Okay, thank you so much for this is really good information. And is there anything that you would like to add? Well, I just want to say that our kids, and I'm speaking as a parent, not as a principal, as a parent. Um, I have three on my own, and um, and I can say that the greatest gift and responsibility that we are given as parents is our children, and and I think that we are living in a world where. There, these generations that are going through the school process um, are, are facing things that no other generation has ever faced in terms of, of, of the negative influence and, and the different things that they wrestle with at, at, at young age. And, and so um, I'm not saying that it has to be Calexico Mission School because wherever you, you're watching this and wherever you happen to be, um, uh, but I'm, I, I would like for for parents out there to not, I, I don't want them to think that, oh, just because it's a private school, it's something that we can't afford or, or you know, it's, it's you know, I've heard, you know, this or that or the other about private schools. Um, I would encourage them to at least explore those, those options because um, they are, you know, um, safe places. Um, Again, like I said, more so now than ever, uh, because you know schools like ours really try hard at, at protecting our kids, not just again from the dangers you know outside, but but guarding their hearts, guarding their minds uh, from the exposure they have to like social media or what they see on TV, and and and, and we're trying to combat that you know to some degree, and and I think that. Um, that we need to find as parents as many tools and resources as we can because it's an uphill battle. Because the moment that we hand that little device to, to, uh, to a kid, and, and I do it too, you know, but, but you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, these younger generations are being raised by Netflix and Roblox and, um, you know, uh, Instagram. And, and, and so they're being exposed to a lot of information and, and they don't know yet how to filter, you know, what's true, what's not. And, 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 and we have to protect them from that. And I think that places like Calexico Mission School um, recognize those dangers and, and they are working uh, intentionally about 
protecting them. Again, more so than from some crazy person coming on campus and starting to shoot around, we, we face a more imminent danger with, with our children, and that is uh, the information that they're being exposed. And, and I think that that to me is more urgent. And, and that's why I just make this appeal, you know, so that parents can recognize that and, and, and find, and, uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, a private school is gonna be the answer, but, but it's maybe one of the answers. And, and, but I just invite you to, to be aware of that and, 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 and be careful um, and, and be intentional about being a parent. Thank you. Yeah.